All right. Well, we've been doing a, a series called, anyone like to remind me this morning? How to live your, how to live your best life. And um, let me just remind you, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 puts it this way. It says, but now let me show you a way of life that is what? Best of all. That is best of all. And so Paul here is about to write chapter 13, which is all about love, commonly known as the love chapter, or as we call it here, the love chapter. Right. So it's the love chapter. And so Paul goes in the middle of his teaching on gifts and everything else. He says, now let me show you the way of life that is best of all. And then he goes on and he starts to talk about what love is. Can I just say this morning that your best life is a loving life? That's what we've learned. Your best life is a loving life. You are at your best when you are a loving person. And so let me talk, let me just then go on. Let's read it again this morning. Um, we've been reading it many times, but let's read it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says this, Paul says, and he's writing to the church in Corinth, which was a very dynamic, uh, gifted church that was growing and exploding, but it was a church also with most trouble. And so Paul writes to them, and this is not like just a, a passage of Scripture, just to read out at weddings, and it's kind of like you frame it and put it up on the wall. No, this was kind of like a, a rebuke to the church in Corinth. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Ouch. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith and can move mountains, and they did, they were visionary people and they were taking their city, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, and they were so committed to their cause and to their church, but if I do that and have not love, I gain nothing. And then Paul defines in two words what love is. He says, love is patient and love is kind. Two sides of the one coin. Patience is what I'm willing to endure and bear from you, but it doesn't just end there. It says love is patient, but love is also kind. Kind. Love is about what I'm prepared to give you. Love is just not enduring. Love is proactive. Who can see that this morning? That's the two sides. So love is patient and love is kind. And then he goes on and he says it, is not, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. We've talked about that for the last couple of weeks. Anyone been getting angry about that? And it, this love is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And it says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love keeps no record of wrong. So last week we talked about putting off bitterness, anger, and rage. And it's not just by trying harder. It's not just by making a decision that that's not going to happen anymore. Um, and I talked about the special oak tree. And an oak tree, um, it's called the Sasha Blue. You can Google it, the Sasha Blue. And it's a special kind of oak tree in the fact that its leaves don't fall off in winter. It's a deciduous tree. Every other deciduous tree on planet Earth, its leaves fall off in winter, but not the Sasha Blue. Its leaves hang on until spring, until a new leaf comes through and pop, pushes the old leaf off. Isn't that a great picture? And so putting off anger and bitterness and rage is not just a matter of going, I'm just going to try harder. No, something else has to grow up inside us and actually push off, put off those things. And so we talked about what that looks like last week. And so we also talked about why we find it so hard. Because we, what we're actually talking about is the word forgiveness. And, why we, and we talked about why we find that so hard. We talked about an unforgiven heart is an unforgiving heart. And so I'm not going to spend any more time on that. You can go back. You can watch them on the YouTube if you'd like to. This morning, I want to dig a little deeper. You know, this is a big deal. This whole forgiveness thing is a really, really big deal. And, you know, for some of you, it might be something in the past. Uh, for some... Uh, some, some of you, it might be something you're in the middle of right now. And if you are, um, I, I hope this sheds some light on, on it for you today. And maybe for some of you, maybe in the future. For some of us, for years, forgiveness wasn't a big deal to me. It's like, but I really, in the essence of it, I, 
I, I really hadn't had much to forgive. And then suddenly some things started happening in my life, which, and you go, well, you think you've got problems, mate. You should see some of mine. And so this is a really big deal because it has the ability to have such an impact upon our life. And I think, you know, it's something um, that we need to get our heads and our hearts around because th- this is graduate level love stuff. This is, this is not, this is not low level stuff. This is, this is, this is something that I believe that God wants us to get a handle on and live it out to its max. Love keeps no record of wrongs, forgiveness. And so that's what it says in verse 11. It says, love keeps no record of wrongs. The King James Version puts it in a way which I think is a little more helpful. It says, love thinks no evil. It thinks no evil, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, it's not provoked, and it thinks no evil. And that's very informative because the word thinks there, uh, in its original, means is the word logikos, which is where we get the word logical, thinking. It means to take inventory. It means to estimate. You know, you, intro, in, you take inventory. You've got a list. You think of all of the ways you were wronged. You take a list. It means to estimate. You're estimating what that's cost you. It means to impute. It means to reckon. Reckon. <laughs> in other words, what you're thinking and the way you're thinking is, seems very logical and factual. It's not without facts to back up what you're thinking. You know, sometimes evil can seem, thinking evil can seem very logical and very natural. It builds a very strong argument as to why you think what you think. So think no evil. Think no evil. And the word evil is the word kakos, kakos. I don't quite know how you pronounce it. But it literally means this. It means worthless, depraved, and injurious. In other words... The person who has wronged you, you begin to think about them. Think no evil. You begin to think about them as being worthless. You're just nothing. You begin to think of them as worthless, depraved. Oh, you are, man, you are just beyond help. You're kind of like, you know, no one can help you, man. You are just beyond help and injurious. You want to hurt them. You want them to feel pain. In fact, you fantasize about hurting them. It reminds me of the, the woman who just had an argument with her husband and she's walking along the beach feeling very angry about her husband and lo and behold she finds a bottle and she picks up the bottle and she pulls a cork out the end and guess what popped out of the bottle? A genie. You guessed it. The genie said, I'm going to give you three wishes but whatever you wish for your husband's going to get twice. You're going to get double. And she said, I want a million dollars. She gets a million dollars. Hubby gets two million. She said, I want a, a new Porsche. New Porsche arrives, guess what he gets? And she said, I want you to scare me half to death. (laughs) That's a smart lady, isn't it? So the question I want to ask this morning is, how do I not think like that? Because we've all been in varying degrees where we think evil. Logically, like this happened, I saw that, it's not unfactual, it's logical. And we begin to think in people in the terms of being worthless, of being depraved, or, and we want to hurt them. So let's see this morning what help we can find from the Word of God. And, and I, there's lots of places I could go, but this morning I've gone to Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verse 17, Romans chapter 12. And I trust this morning you find this really insightful and really helpful. Verse 17 says... Remember, what are we thinking? We're thinking no what? No E, sounds like V-I-L. Thinking no, thank you. Thinking no evil. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not means do not. (laughs) Repay anyone, and that means anyone, evil for evil. Be careful what, to do what is right in, in the eyes of everyone. It is po- if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, oh, I'd love to talk about that. It's so practical. Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will, burn, you will heap burning coals on his head. Key verse, verse 21. 
Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So the word overcome here means, it's a, it's a, it's a military term, and it means to defeat, and it means to conquer. If you think about that, there's, there's, there's a battle, there's something to do, it's proactive, it means to defeat and conquer. But it only gives us two possibilities, there's only two possibilities here, and the first possibility is that you will either be overcome by evil, or you will overcome evil by doing good. Have you got that? There's only, there's only two options, be overcome or overcome. And how do you overcome? You overcome with good. So if you've been hurt, if someone has hurt you, if you want to hurt them back, if you, if you want to maintain you know, the, the, the desire and the want in your heart to hurt them, to injure them, can I just say this? You are literally being overcome by evil. It's getting the better of you. You've lost, evil is winning. Because there's something in you that wants to hurt them. And so that's evil starting to overcome. So let me just, let me just break that open a little bit, give you a couple of examples, and there's lots, but let me just give you a couple. If, if you've been hurt and you just want to maintain the rage, you want to hurt them, you just want to keep a level of anger, um, one, it's going to distort relationships. It's going to distort, evil is going to win because it's going to distort your relationships. And it works a little bit like this, because when, when you've been hurt, you constantly replay, you want, there's a desire to replay the tape. And you're constantly rewinding, replaying, and you stop it, and that's your, fa- oh, that's my favorite bit there. Mm. And, you, and you're replaying this tape in your head, and you do it, it it's your, to justify your anger, and it's, it's your logic. It's, it's kind of like you're replaying the tape. And when you do that, you create a picture of them. You see them in a certain way. They begin to... They have a caricature. Let me give you an example. If someone lies to you and you, you're hurt and if, if you let that just stay and mull and churn, eventually you start, to, you start to characterize them and you flatten them right down to like, it's just, you're just a liar. You're a liar. I've just characterized you as a liar. You've, you know, if, if you lie... And you get caught, well, um, well, yes, I lied, but it's complicated. Um, you know, let me tell you why. So they're, they, well, they're, they're just liars. You're just a liar. You have just flattened them. They're one-dimensional. You're a liar. But you, you're three-dimensional. You're nuanced. You're complicated. <laughs> Can you see the difference? And so... What happens is that then spills over. So once you've categorized someone, you've just gone, you know, you're just, it, you start to, it flows over into other relationships. So for instance, if you're a man and you've been hurt by a woman and you're angry about that, uh, it's going to affect your relationship with other women. Eventually it's like all women are just, and vice versa. So you start, it starts to spill over into other relationships. Father, if you've, if you've had a, a bad experience with your father, it's kind of like, and you haven't worked that out, you, you just, you flatten them just like they're all, and it starts to, you look at every father the same way. And it starts to spill over into other relationships in your life. And it's, you know, you, it applies to race, you know, all people from this race, you know, because of an experience, they're this, or an economic class, or, you know, all plumbers. They all drop toothbrushes in the toilet and don't tell you. That's another story. If you weren't here a few weeks ago, that's another story. And so what happens is it begins to distort all other relationships. Who can see that this morning? And so it distorts. So and when, when that happens, when it starts to distort your relationships, evil's won. You've lost because it's distorting other relationships. You're starting to characterize everybody in that, those people, them. And then it distorts your relationship with you. It changes the way in which you view yourself. And so, and this is the other side of it. So if you're constantly replaying the tape of what they did, 
and, and you flatten them just to the, they're just liars or whatever, it also distorts you because to, to maintain that, you start to tend to feel a little, you have to feel a little bit superior to them. You have to feel a little bit noble or, you know, you begin to put our, we put our soft lens on ourselves. if you know what I'm talking about. We start to airbrush little bits of our own life out because, you know, they're just that. And so I, to maintain that, I actually have to start to distort my own view of myself. And it's sort of, you know, you begin to airbrush out bits of you and you become very self-righteous and you become full of self-pity and it's kind of like, you know, what I've been through and what people have done to me. Look how I've suffered. And when you arrive at that place, you are, there is no place that will make you more open or tempted to be be, becoming cruel or dishonest. It makes you open to temptation. If you have the opportunity to do something cruel to that person, you will do it because deep in your heart you're saying, I deserve this. You know, you might have been hurt by the company that you work for. So it's kind of like, and you might have been, you know, and you've played that tape and it was so unjust and so bad. And it's like, you have the opportunity to steal from them. You have the opportunity to sabotage them. You have the opportunity to send them broke. You'll do it. And it's kind of because deep in your heart is that little sense of, well, after what they did for me, I deserve this. I deserve this. So you've become open to evil. Evil has overcome you. You've lost. Who can see that this morning? So how do I overcome evil how do I overcome evil by being good or with good? Well, the answer is forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is, you know, forgiveness is a word that can be twisted and misunderstood, and I'll bring a little bit of clarity to it in a moment. But the Bible actually here in this passage doesn't use the word forgive, and I actually think that's a good thing. In fact, because I think it gives us something a little more concrete and a little bit more prescriptive than just this word forgive. Look what it says in verse 17. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Now, that is more than just your external actions. Matthew 18, uh, some of you would know this, it talks about, you know, not just, you know, don't murder, but then it goes on and says, don't murder, but then it says what? It says, don't hate. So it's not just the external action, it's what's going on in your heart, right? Um, it says uh, in Matthew 8, and it says, don't commit adultery. You know, you've heard it said, I, the Bible says, don't, you know, the law says don't commit adultery, but I say, don't look at a woman with lust in your heart. It's about what's going on in your heart, right? The law says, do not steal. Jesus said, I say, don't envy. You got this. It's the heart that is ultimately infected. And maybe you will or you won't be able to express it in a behavior, but that's not the point. Forgiveness means that it's not, only, it's not only not taking revenge in an external way, but it's not taking revenge in your heart. How do we know God does a real job? It's not just about that. You know, religion is about externals. God is about getting into the core of it and he gets into our heart. So let's talk about overcoming evil with forgiveness. What does this forgiveness thing mean? Let me just give you a few things around forgiveness. Let me give you some things that forgiveness isn't. Let me create, let me clear up some confusion. Firstly, not create confusion, but clear up confusion, hopefully. Number one, forgiveness is not conditional. It's not based upon another's response. It's not earned, nor is it deserved. It's not bargained for. I'll forgive you if. No, 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 no. That's not forgiveness. That's bargaining. Best example, Jesus on the cross. They didn't ask for forgiveness. They didn't deserve forgiveness. And what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They didn't promise to do anything any different. He just said, Father, forgive them. It's unconditional. It was unasked for. The reality of it is some people will never ask for forgiveness. What are you going to do? Does that mean you're stuck? Some people can't ever ask for forgiveness because they're not even with us anymore. They're dead. What do you do? So forgiveness is not conditional. Secondly, forgiveness is not minimalizing an offense. You know, it's kind of like, no, no, that didn't hurt me. 
No, no, it was nothing. You know, we kind of think forgiveness is somehow just playing it all down and it's just like, well, you know, it's not such a big deal. It's a bit like when your older brother used to punch you, you know, and it's like, no, that didn't hurt. And then around the corner, <laughs> cry your eyes out. It's kind of like, you know, that didn't hurt, didn't hurt, didn't hurt. Oh. So it's not minimalizing an offense. You know, that's, that's not forgiveness, that's lying. So it's not trying to minimalize an offense. Number three, it's not forgetting what happened. You know, who has, who's heard the saying? Well, you just got to forgive and forget. Can I just say, baloney. Impossible. What you try to forget, you focus on. And the harder you try and forget something, I'm going to forget that, I'm going to forget that. And the harder you try and forget that, you focus on that the more, and the more you focus on something, guess what? The more you move towards it. You need to understand the difference between forgetting and letting go. Two different things. Letting go is such a different thing to forgetting. You know, one man once said, man, whenever I have an argument with my wife, she gets historical. I said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She remembers every wrong thing I've ever done. <laughs> Darling, you've got a dent. There's a dent in the car. Yeah, well, you've been booked three times in the last 12 months. Now, that was purely for illustrative purposes, all right? Did not... <laughs> Remember, love keeps no record. And I think the best illustration, and some of you may have seen this before, but it's like, who remembers the days when you used to send the good old days, when you used to send your, your, your film, your photographic film off to the chemist, off to the chemist? Your, your, your 12 or your 24 or your 36, who remembers those days? You send it off and then you'd wait for five months. But if you paid $5,000, you could get it back in three months. What? Anyway, I'm exaggerating just a little bit. But you get your photos back and then you'd open up the envelope and you get the photos out and you've got your photo album out, spread out and, you know, the plastic pulled off ready to put in your photos. And you go through and you go, oh, that's a wonderful photo of me. Oh, gee, I look, gee, I look. Isn't it amazing when we look at photos? Who's the person that we look at first? Absolutely. All the family looks great. No, no, I'm, I'm squinting just a little bit there. I'll throw that one out. And it's like, family, oh, the family looks terrible here, but I look good. That's going in. It's like, but it's like, no, no, what you do is you go through the album and you, ch you, know, you throw out all of the good photos and then you go, oh man, that's a terrible photo. I'm going to put that one in the album. Would you do that? How does it work? It works the opposite, doesn't it? You get the good photos and you go, oh man, that's worth keeping that one. I'm going to put that in. These bad photos, I'm going to let them go. And we've got to understand the difference between forgetting and letting things go. So forgiving is not forgetting, it's letting things go. Fourthly, forgiveness is not, it's not my right to forgive somebody when I wasn't the one that was hurt. I can't forgive somebody on the offended party's behalf. Years ago in America, I, I can remember this, a 14-year-old boy shot three young girls. And when they took him into the children's court to face the judge, people were outside holding up signs saying, we forgive you, Mike. Well, it wasn't their right to forgive him. I know what they were trying to do. But the parents, they're the ones that need to do the forgiving. Who can see that? So it's not your right to forgive someone else on behalf of someone else who's been wronged. And then fifthly, this is a really important one. And I think it's the one that's most misunderstood around this concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not resuming a relationship without any changes. Forgiveness is not the same as restoring a relationship. When we do that, we confuse forgiveness with trust. Some people are afraid to forgive because you think that everything has to go back how it was before. Wrong. Forgiveness can be instant. Let me tell you, it's a process, but it comes with a decision, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. 
But trust is built over a period of time, correct? For instance, if the good people taking up the off, someone taking up the offering in this church did a runner with it after church, I could forgive them for that. How about you? How about you? Anyone here ready to forgive them? Okay, the person on the offering is thinking, oh my God. Now I might forgive them for stealing the offering, but I'm not going to put them back on the offering box next week, right? I'm not going to trust them. Trust is built, rebuilt over a long period of time, depending on the severity of what has happened. See, for restoration to take place, for relationship, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just I have to put this out there. You know, there has to be genuine repentance. Genuine repentance from someone. It's not just like, oh, I'll never do it again. Uh, it, it, there needs to be restitution made where possible. Repentance shown by restitution as best you can. Zacchaeus, he'd stolen all the money off the people he gave back way more. Restitution needs to be made. And then trust needs to be built over time. Who can see that this morning? So, you know, repeat offenders, people who, re- who constantly, re- repeatedly offend in some area. Well, they need to be forgiven again and again, but to let them back into your life? Well, that's another whole story, my friend. So trust doesn't mean that things resume as per, sorry, forgiveness doesn't mean that re- relationship resumes as per normal. Trust needs to be restored, right? So how then do I forgive? So there's some things about trust. I hope that gives a little clarity. So how then do I forgive? Let's go back to the passage. Verse 14 says, Bless those who persecute persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. If you dig down to that a little bit, bless someone means to actually pray for them. The beginning of forgiving somebody is by beginning by praying for them. Oh, I'll pray for them, all right? God, kill them. God, just mess them up bad. Would you make that idiot, please? Open his eyes. Well, okay, you're on your way, all right? You've started. Congratulations. At least you're praying. (laughs) You see, what happens is when you start to pray for someone who's wronged you, firstly, And very importantly, it begins to knock down the distorted view you have of yourself. Because when you become aware of the one that you're praying to, you firstly are faced with who you are, right? And it starts to break down the distorted view that you've built up by playing this this tape over and over and over in your head and feeling a little bit superior and airbrushing yourself out. Suddenly, you're before God and suddenly the view of yourself begins to change. And then as your view of yourself begins to change, your heart then can begin to open up a just a teeny weeny weeny little crack towards them. So you start with prayer. Is that good? Okay, start with that. Number two, you've got to release the debt. Verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil with evil. You see, you've got a list, your logical thinking, your logic list. It's all about the debt that you owe. This is what you owe me. This is what you have done. This is my list. And I've been rehearsing my list and I've been thinking about my list. And releasing the debt, guess what it's doing? It's ripping up the list. It's going, this was my list of what you owed me. I am releasing you from the debt. Objection, Your Honour. Someone's got to pay. And this is a thing, and this is a reason why we find this so hard, because it's like, how can I let them off the hook? They have to pay. Someone has to pay. Can I just remind you this morning, friend? Someone has already paid. Think of Jesus on the cross. Think of Jesus before the cross. He's been been scourged. His body's been marred more than any man. He's carried that cross up to the top of Mount Golgotha. He's been 
put, had nails put through his hands. He's had that agonizing crucifixion, that cruel thing that the Romans invented and they were experts at it. He'd been through excruciating pain. And then he, he says, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. He dies. He gives up his spirit. Aren't we glad that wasn't the end of the story? But listen, and we say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for giving me my sin. Thank you that you paid in full my sin. But Jesus, I can't forgive them. Jesus, it was a great job that you did. You've paid the price for every sin, but you just not quite. You didn't quite do enough for them. Did you hear that? Somebody has paid in full. Your sin, my sin, every sin of the past, every sin of the present, every sin of the future, all been paid for. For people that went to say, Jesus, forgive me. How many of you believe that this morning? Does anyone else here believe that this morning? So we release the debt because the debt has already been paid. And then number three, so number one, we pray for them. Number two, we release the debt. And then number three, a bit like a script, we repeat as necessary. <laughs> we repeat as necessary. Forgiveness is rarely a one-time event. And it may take you many, many... You know, Peter come to Jesus once and said, Jesus, how many times should we forgive our brother? Seven times? How magnanimous and forgiving am I? Because it was Jewish law to forgive people three times. And Peter was, man, he doubled and added one. Seven times? And Jesus said, 70 times, seven times. In other words, no end. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. And you might say this morning, I can't. I'm too angry. Can I suggest this morning that you're too angry because you haven't forgiven? You see, forgiveness, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like it. I'm too angry. Can I say this morning, forgiveness is a command. Let me just ramp this up a little bit. Forgiveness is a command. Mark eleven twenty five. Read it and let your blood boil with me. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, what's the next line say? Forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. That's a big part of this as well, but let's just focus on. If, you're, if you stand praying and you think of someone who you hold something against. What does it say to do? Forgive them. Don't wait for them to come crawling to you. Doesn't, don't wait till you're feeling a warm fuzzy and it's like, oh, I just want to go and forgive them now. God is not commanding an emotion. You can't command an emotion. What he's saying is this, listen, forgiveness is something you grant before you feel it. Did you catch that? It's something you grant before you feel it. And you are making a commitment that you are not going to retaliate and hurt them. You're going to no longer make that your goal. You're not going to indirectly retaliate and slander them. And, you know, let me tell you, that's retaliating just the same by slandering them. You, and, and here's the thing, when it starts to get inside your heart, when you're thinking about them and that, that tape starts to play and into your heart comes this, oh, I just want to, I just want to hurt them. You know, it's like you start playing Christian voodoo and it's kind of like you got this doll and you've got pins and you're going, ee, 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 ee. I just, sorry, I need healing. <laughs> you hear me this morning? You start to, you, you promise that you're going to not retaliate, listen carefully, not going to indirectly retaliate, 
You're not going to stick those pins inside your heart into them. And that means that what? That's a matter of your will, not your emotions. And so you're going to pray. You're going to release them of the debt. But it doesn't end there. And you might think this morning, well, okay, God, I'm praying for them. I've released them from the debt. I'm off the hook. I've done what you've asked. But there's one more step. And this is, this is key. Don't miss this. Because this is, not about, this is about not being overcome with evil, but it's about what? Overcoming with, with good. So here's the proactive part. So, you, okay, you're, you're praying for them. You're not letting your heart run away with you. You're releasing them in your heart from the debt. And then listen to what it says in verse 20. It says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. What's that all about? What's that saying? It's saying this, give them what they need. Do something proactive. Now, what does that mean, to give them what they need? Does that mean I send them cards and chocolates and flowers? Does that mean I just kind of, you know, it's, again, it's all warm fuzzy? no. What you need is some, what they need is very nuanced. It's very broad, and I, I can't do it credit, but just so that you can get the idea, is you need to give them, love gives them what they need. And so, for instance, you know, an addict, and someone's an addict and they won't admit it. The last thing they need is for you to trust them. Yeah? That's not going to help them. That's not what they need. Someone's hurting you, and they're constantly hurting other people. They need to be confronted. That's what they need, right? That's loving. It's, it's never loving to make it easy for someone to go on sinning. Did you hear me? And so I'm praying and I'm not hurting them and I'm not holding a grudge. I'm off the hook. There's one more step because this is not about being overcome by evil, but this is about overcoming evil with good. You're going to do something proactive. I'm going to give them what they need. And that's the greatest test of the first few. What do they need? Overcome evil with good. I'm going to bless by praying for them. I'm going to release the debt. I'm going to repeat if necessary. And I'm going to meet them with what they need. How many of you got this this morning? You see, as I said at the start of this, kind of the worship team up, this is one of the hardest things that we have to live out. You know, the, we've got a big advantage over people who don't know Jesus. Because the Bible tells us in Colossians, have a listen to what it says in Colossians. It says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, what does it say? Say it out loud. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. There, right there, that's the key. I said last week, an unforgiven heart is an unforgiving heart. And we have a, such a, you know, this is like insider trading. <laughs> we actually, we first can go to a place where we can be totally forgiven ourselves. And when we come before God and we ask for forgiveness and have a forgiving heart, when we think of the cross and the price that Jesus paid for our forgiveness of our sins and we see ourselves as who we really are, how can we not find the strength as hard as it is? God then gives us the strength and the power to begin to forgive others. Who can see that this morning? And as I said, for some of you today, it's like, yeah, all right. What's for lunch? But for some of you, this is the moment, this is the battle of your life. The Bible says that we will be known by our love for one another, by our ability to forgive one another, to keep no record of wrongs. This is real stuff, isn't it, church? And, it apply, and the closer people are to us, the more of that we have to do. Families, relationships, workplaces, neighbours, all of the above. 
and church. And this morning, we can come to God and we can say, Father, thank you that I can forgive my brother or my sister with all of the things that I've talked about today. Understanding it the way I do today, I can forgive. And you know, when you do that, do you know who's set free? Do you know who's released the most? You are. You're the one that's set free. You, if you want to let someone hurt you for the rest of your life, you continue to carry that. And they're hurting you over and over and over again. The more you replay that thing in your mind and the more you, the more animosity and the want to hurt, the longer it is that you're kept in a prison yourself. And then the thing that you find, when you find that in your heart, to take that step of saying, God, by your grace, I forgive them because you've forgiven me. You're set free. Who believes that this morning? Come on, stand to your feet.